Well, good morning, everybody. It's, it's fantastic to be here this morning as you discuss Vision 2020. And I know it's not my business, but I think it looks really inspiring. This is my very first time at a General Assembly. I hope it's the first of many opportunities to be with you at your assemblies in the years to come. And as it's my first time, because I've only been Director of Christian Aid for, for nearly three months, I wanted to speak to you really personally today about me and my journey to Christian Aid, because I want you to feel that you've started to get to know me, and I want you to know that you should feel free to contact me and my colleagues at Christian Aid whenever you like. That's because Christian Aid is your development agency, and we're really proud of that. So, how did I come to be here? I wanted to say a word first about my faith journey. I, I'm from an Italian family. I was born and brought up on the Isle of Wight in, into a Roman Catholic family, and I spent my first you know, 18 years or so in the Roman Catholic Church. But I found my faith ebbing away in my late teens and into my 20s and began to feel a little bit lost. And uh, as I became a mum in my 30s, looked for some new way to express my spirituality. And then about 10 years ago, walked into my local church in Dulwich, where I live in South London, a Church of England church, and felt so very at home, completely at home, and able to put down the weight that I've been carrying on my own for 20 years. What about my journey to Christian aid? It's, it's hardly a linear one, I have to say. I started life as a lawyer, as a criminal lawyer, um, doing a kind of diet of rapes and murders and uh, quite a lot of fraud. I mean, not doing it, obviously, representing, <laughs> representing people accused of doing it. Um, I found that actually technically quite straightforward, but emotionally really difficult as a 25-year-old representing a woman who was accused of murdering her child. Um, you know, things like that are really difficult to do when you're in your mid-twenties. And I decided that, well, technically I might be up to it. Emotionally, I wasn't up to it. And I decided to become a prosecutor and try and make sure that happened as fairly and robustly as possible. And from that, I found my way into financial regulation, where I stayed until 2004, trying to make sure that financial malpractice was cracked down on. And in 2004, I decided really I'd like to run my own thing and I'd like to run something really worthwhile. Maybe I could run a charity and I kind of realized that I'd be a, quite an odd candidate for something like that after my journey so far. And I thought, I'm going to lead something else that's more obvious and hopefully that will give me the skills to lead a charity in due course. So I went to run something called the Financial Services Compensation Scheme, which looks after you if your bank goes bust or your insurance company. I thought that would be a quiet job because actually those things don't really happen very often. I, I could learn, you know, I could learn quietly, I could make lots of mistakes, and I could emerge a chief executive who could run a charity in, in due course. And then, of course, the financial crisis happened, and I found myself looking at TV screens, seeing the run on Northern Rock in, in uh, 2007, realising that the Lord was going to ask something quite big of me um, in, in the months to come. So two things happened to me. I found myself professionally having to bail out to look after victims of bank failures in 2008 that required the payment out of £21 billion to victims of financial failure. That was not something I thought I would have to do when I went into that job. And what God told me through that, I think, is that I was capable of doing things I hadn't expected to be able to do. I think it, it teaches us something about putting our trust in him. And something else very personal happened to me in 2008, which really changed my life very drastically. And that was the death of my brother, Anthony. Um, some of you will never have heard of him at all. Some of you will know that Anthony Mingella was a, a film director of great talent who made films like The English Patient and Truly Madly Deeply and Cold Mountain and, and so on. To me, he was a really lovely brother. I miss him every day. Um, when he died really unexpectedly in March 2008, um, it was a great, obviously a great blow to all of my family. We're a really close family. And I'm one of five children. But I felt God very close in those dark days after that, um, saying to me, you know, life is very short. What are you doing? Are you doing the right thing? Are you doing the very best you can? And I knew then that I was called to do something else. Um, and once, once I got my organization through the financial crisis, I knew it was time to move. And then I saw the advert for the director of Christian Aid, and I saw a job 
that would enable me to bring the faith into the heart of my work, that would enable me to use the chief executive skills that I'd grown and bring them to bear on, on, I think, one of the biggest causes of all, the eradication of global poverty. And I thought to myself, what an amazing job. What a lucky person who gets that job. And I was talking to my kids about it. My kids are the greatest leaders. Weren't those kids amazing that we saw earlier? My kids are 12 and 16. And my daughter said to me, Mom, you keep looking at that advert. You're not going to get that job unless you apply for it. <laughs> and the more I got it out of it, because I cut it out of the newspaper, the more I got it out, the more she said, come on, Mum, you know, you're meant to apply for that job. And so I decided that, you know, although it wasn't the most obvious thing <laughs> to expect to get this job, uh, that if I didn't apply, I wouldn't get it. So I applied, I put my trust in God, and here I am. What did I think that Christian Aid actually did before I joined? Well, I thought it was an organization that worked in nearly 50 countries with the huge ambition to eradicate global poverty through relief, development, campaigning, challenging the structures that keep people poor, working through partners, helping people of all faiths and none in Christ's name. I was right about that. So what surprised me? What didn't I really bargain for? I didn't expect quite the overwhelming passion and energy and impatience inside the organization to change the world. What a huge privilege it is to work with so many talented and expert colleagues, two of whom are here today. And as I go around the world meeting with so many people beyond Christian Aid, like all of you here today, both in developed and developing countries who also want to bring good news to the poor. Christian Aid is a place where meetings can start with a prayer, not something I've ever experienced in any other job. Where work can be talking to the Prime Minister about maternal mortality, or studying a Bible passage with a colleague, or working out how to respond to a new emergency. There was an earthquake in China very, very soon after I joined. The biggest thing that struck me is how clever the work is. The work is amazingly smart how far we go to the, get the best possible impact on poverty. So in our relief work in places like Haiti, we're looking not only to respond to the urgent need, but to build back better, to build back more resilient communities for the future. In our development work, we're also looking to help people in the South campaign in their own countries for better government and join that up with our campaigning at home. Everything connects, everything reinforces for maximum impact. I've seen that impact in developing countries for myself now because I was lucky enough to go in April to Kenya to see the projects that some of you may have heard about in Christian Aid Week. So I've been to that slum in Matapeni outside Nairobi where 2,000 people live, where there is no, there's no place to go to the toilet. There are no showers. There is no clean water supply. I was taken round Matapeni by a woman called Evelyn Kutuku, the 27, a very articulate young woman who described the conditions there and took me around the slum. I walked along the main path, which is over an open drain, which is full of untreated human waste, because where are people supposed to go? And rats. And she took me into her hut, where she lives with eight other people. It's barely bigger than where I'm standing. It's a tiny little space where her mum was and two of her nephews and her father. And we sat there together and she showed me the floor where when it rained, the water from the drain, the sewer, came up and sewage would arrive inside the slum. Tiny little hut, very dark. And two little boys there, the same age roughly as my boy, and I said, is it too hard to get them to school? And she said, it's really important that they go to school. We try and get, there every, get them there every day that we can. But it actually depends on whether they've had enough to eat. Because if they haven't eaten the day before, if they haven't eaten in the morning, it's just too long for them to go all day to school without something to eat. So they need to be here as soon as we can feed them. It just depends on that. It depends on how well the business has gone. And I said, oh, what's the business? And she said, you passed it on the way in to the hut. It's a Greek grocery business. And then I remembered that I'd passed a tub of water with a few tomatoes and a few lettuce type things floating about in it. That was their business. That's that's what hand-to-mouth actually looks like. 
And she said, it's not so much that that's worrying us at the moment, it's my dad. And she drew back this little curtain and showed me her dad, who was barely alive, um, dying from cancer. And she said, he's been through a lot of chemotherapy, but we just can't afford any more treatment now. They want to give him radiotherapy, but it's so many Kenyan shillings. She gave me the number, translated into 12 pounds. It's just absolutely astronomically expensive. There is no way we can afford it. So we know that he's going to die soon. And she said, the thing he's most worried about now is the fact that he can't even leave us with enough money to bury him. We won't be able to bury him. And I, I, I found it very difficult sitting there listening to that, that prospect for them because he was obviously very close to death then. And she said then something I didn't at first understand. She said, the thing is, Loretta, I'd really like to preserve myself. And I thought, that's a funny thing to say. That's a strange thing to say. What does she mean? Because I'm quite naive, really. And then I realized that she was saying she knew how, could, how she could pay for the kids to go to school. She knew how she could pay for her father to be buried when he died. She could turn to prostitution, as so many women around her in the community had, had felt the need to do. But she didn't want to go there. And I asked her what kept her going, and she said, my faith keeps me going. Every morning I wake up, I thank God we're still here to face another day. And also, I get a lot of... I, I get a lot of fulfillment out of my paralegal work because I give advice to other members of the community about their rights. And I said, oh, I'm a lawyer as well. And she grabbed my hand and she said, so, we are the same. And that stayed with me. That will always still stay with me, that conversation. We are the same. We are entitled to our dignity. And while she doesn't have hers, I don't feel I have mine. I was really glad to see in the afternoon a place down the road where we've been working for a couple of years, a slum called Kiambu, where working with our partner and with the community there, we've established clean toilets, showers, clean water supply. People have uh, what they really want, which is somewhere private to go to the toilet, somewhere to get clean. They have clean water, which means the disease in the slum has radically reduced, because a lot of these diseases are exacerbated by the absence of clean water. And they run now these facilities as a small business. They make a small profit, and they use that profit actually to start buying their own land so they can move out of the slum in due course. We're giving them a hand up, not a hand out. You, of course, are involved, many of you, in supporting the work of Christian aid partners through Commitment for Life. I'm not going to talk endlessly about Commitment for Life because I gather yesterday that John Marsh spoke very movingly about the work in Zimbabwe that you support. But, of course, you're supporting work in Bangladesh, Jamaica, Zimbabwe and Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. And for those of you who don't know much about it, here's a booklet which you can pick up at the back which will tell you more about it. It's really, really brilliant work. It's an amazing opportunity for us to work with you to ensure that some really brilliant projects get funded and people's lives are changed for the better. Thanks so much to every church that signs up for Commitment for Life. We know just how much it means to people in those four areas. And I'm going to be going to Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory in October, and I hope to see some of the Commitment for Life projects at that time. I was asked to say something about my vision for Christian Aid in 2020. Well, I can't call it Vision 2020 now, can I? Because you've, you've got that one. Um, I don't think I can steal it from you. I'm still forming that vision now because I've only just arrived. It's not something I can do on my own. I'll be working on a consultation process over the next year to work out what that vision looks like. And I'm looking forward to engaging with you about that. I've got a lot of listening to do.